All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is the last part in our series of videos on great ideas in psychology, great ideas in psychology based on a book by Professor Fatali Moaddam with the same title. Uh, we made it to the end. This, is, uh, this part is based on chapter 20 of the book. So let me begin um, with sharing my screen first. Uh, here we are. This chapter is about social constructionism and social constructionism in psychology. Here's a list of topics we covered so far, and we have covered a lot. If you have been with me uh, throughout all of this, uh, I thank you for, for your attention, and I look forward to more feedback from you. I'm very grateful for the thoughtful feedback I've received so far. And uh, since the series of videos are going to be available online, I look forward to more comments, more feedback from you, because you can watch the videos at any time. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do in the near future, uh, beginning July 9th, is a kind of extension on Freudian um, psychoanalysis, or the Freudian unconscious and its applications in everyday practical life. I am going to teach a brief course over three sessions only. Each session is about an hour and a half. The course is based on, based loosely on Eric Burns' book, Games People Play. It's a wonderful book. It's a nice in introduction to Burns' transactional analysis, which is a way of thinking about human behavior and therapy therapeutic relationships and the aim of therapy, the aim of self-improvement. So games people play is a way of, I mean, my course, the way I think about it, I want it to be a way of bringing awareness to our social relationships and a way of being more responsible, being more aware and being more responsible in the way we deal with other people, especially people who are close to us. All right, so games people play. Uh, I'm most likely going to make some references to popular culture and movies. One of the movies that I would like to talk about is a classic movie called uh, 12 Angry Men that was made in 1957, I believe. It's a black and white movie. It's a really great movie, and it's, um, it's one of those movies that you can, um, you can get a lot out, out of. <laughs> you can get a lot out of. It will be a very rich and fruitful discussion. Uh, through the lens of transactional analysis and Eric Byrne. All right, so that's that. Uh, that's the announcement about the short course. Um, it will be on Light Hall, and the, the link to the, the website is in the descriptions of this video. All right, so this chapter, part 20, is, as I said, about social constructionism, and it addresses questions like, what is social constructionism? So what is it? Let's begin uh, responding to this question. Social constructionism is a perspective. It is a broad framework for thinking about things, for think thinking about topics, including psychology, social sciences in general, and human reality, human cultural reality. So it is a perspective in social sciences and more broadly that challenges the existence of things in the world and claims that they are products. So things in the world, the way we think about them, the way we experience things in the world, these things are products of coordinated social activity and consensus. So the way you think about something like a father or a woman, according to social constructionism, these are not things that you find in the world already, already existing as they are, as we experience them. We don't just find them, we, uh, they are the product of our social activities that are in coordination with other people, collective activity, and a kind of agreement is behind them, a kind of consensus is behind them, even though that consensus might have a long history. So examples, what are socially construct, what are some of the examples of socially constructed things that aren't, we don't just find as things in the world? Examples include IQ, schizophrenia, neuroticism, personality traits. What else? You can think about other examples that you might immediately think of or other people might immediately think that, oh, it's just something uh, in, the, in, in the world. It's part of nature. For example, 
um, the fear centers in the brain. Um, there are other examples we can uh, use in thinking about social construction. One of them is um, quite well known. It is a product or it was an aspect of a classical civilization in India. It has a very long history because it's, uh, the origin is in classical civilization, one of the classical civilizations. And it is the caste system um, in the classical Indian culture. And according to this caste system, people in society are divided based on their, where they belong in this hierarchy. And the way somebody who's in that caste system and experiences the caste system from within it as a member, as a participant within the system is a very different experience compared to uh, some of us who are outside of it. So the outside view and the inside view are very different. And that is part of the point that we want to make in our discussion of social constructionism. From, a, from an outsider's perspective, these levels, the divisions and higher levels of the caste and the lower levels of the, uh, the, uh, on, in the caste, they seem quite arbitrary. And it, seem, it might seem unfair why somebody based on where they are placed in society, where they are, when, where they are born, the family where they are born, uh, the, the trade or the, the, the work that their the fa their father does, based on those random, arbitrary, accidental features, are judged, and their mobility how how much they can do, how much they can change their lives, how much they can control the rest of their lives is determined uh, by that caste system and the rules of the caste system, the norms of the caste system. Somebody from outside might be surprised by the rigidity of the system. Somebody from inside, on the other hand might see the caste system as not a system that is agreed upon, not a product of coordinated activity, but instead simply a part of nature. This is how things are. This is how things are. The gods are on top and the priests, the, uh, the class of the priesthood is one level lower than the gods and so on and so forth until at the end, which, where we have this category of the, the outcasts or on the untouchables. So th that's, a person who is really immersed in the caste system, they really they experience the social reality with those categories. So those categories are not just labels, they are things. They are things in the world. They are types of people in the world. Another example, this actually is discussed in the book as an example. Look at these, um, these kind of, it's a kind of priesthood, clergy, a class of cler clergymen in a branch of, uh, Islam, Shia, Shia Islam, um, they kind of look like zombies, to be honest. But <laughs> uh, these lively, cheerful gentlemen in this photo, they, uh, they're all clergy, but you might notice that the turban or the headwear on, on the head of one of these men is black, unlike the other ones that are, um, unlike most other ones. I think there's one other black one. Um, and that signifies something. The black turban, the head, black headwear, is it signifies a category. The category is called Sayyid. And the category Sayyid in Shia Islam refers to people who are descendants of the prophet. So they are the son of a son of a son of a son of a... If you uh, follow that, uh, that tree, that family tree, you're supposed to get to the prophet himself. So that makes them special. It gives them a special status within a Shia community, within the community of Shia Muslims. Um, that is part of how they are referred to. Um, and you, some people might treat them even differently with more respect. And non-Sayyids, by contrast, are maybe they are treated with less respect. What is important is that that category is recognized. And for some people, it is not just an arbitrary designation based on a random criteria. It is part of the way they perceive and experience reality, the way reality is divided and identified parts of reality is identified for them. Uh, let's move on. Another example, these magnificent uh, Buddha statues in the city uh, Bamiyan. Bamiyan is a city now in Afghanistan. And uh, these statues are culturally, they were culturally very significant because they reflect 
a kind of synthesis of the Greek civilization and the relatively more Eastern civilization and this the central the central element here being Buddhism. It's a statue of Buddha, but if you carefully look at the clothing of these Buddha statues, you see the the the, the elements that are from Greek civilization. So it, it, they are really significant in what they represent. They represent a kind of peaceful coexistence and a kind of synthesis in cultural artifacts like this uh, huge statue. The statues were unfortunately destroyed by the Taliban. And that's because of how Taliban regarded them, how these statues were constructed, socially constructed and experienced and viewed and judged from the perspective of the ta Taliban. Specifically, Taliban regarded the statues as idols. And when something is an idol, it is uh, competing in a wrongful way, in a sinful way. Um, it is competing for our attention with God. So an idol is a bad thing. It should be, therefore, it should be destroyed. Others, like you and I, probably, regard these statues as culturally, historically significant. They are cultural treasures that, uh, that were lost because of the acts of destruction by Taliban. So we, we grieve over the loss of these, these artifacts. So within a culture, so we talked about the classical civilization, uh, Indian classical civilization, we talk about, talked about Shia Islam, and he talked about the perspective of Taliban on those Buddha statues in Bamiyan. These examples, are, they all show that within a culture, the categories uh, are experienced as natural part of reality. So an idol is a thing in reality. It is not something that we agree upon to call something, the category of untouchable or category of priests. We don't just make these things up. I mean, we don't experience them as made up. We experience them even though they are made up. We experience them as already existing in the world in the outside world, and we find them. From the outside uh, of the culture, the same categories are seen as arbitrary, unnecessary, and strange. Strange how they govern people's lives and behaviors. Here's a quote that I really like. Uh, the quote is by philosopher sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. Um, he wrote that every established order tends to produce the naturalization of its own arbitrariness. That means within every cultural system, the categories that operate within that culture are seen as natural. So the established order produces not only the categories, but the naturalization of those categories, how those categories are experienced as natural, even though they are arbitrary, even though the whole natural, the, the whole um, order the whole cultural social order is the way it is organized is arbitrary. Um, here's another quote relevant. Um, here we read, the most successful ideological effects are those which have no need for words and ask no more than complicitous silence. So if you're defending something, if you're defending the category of untouchables, for example, that it is useful, or if you're defending the category of Sayyid in Shia Islam, if you're Defending it, it already means that it is um, no longer natural, that its arbitrariness is already revealed and that the ideological system is relatively unsuccessful because when it is really successful, the ideological effect should be just silence and acting as if those categories are part of nature, they're natural. Okay, now social constructionism um, identifies in a very useful way, it identifies our own role in construction of categories, in bringing about, making up the categories for referring to and describing a phenomena. It is a reaction to another way of thinking about natural phenomena, namely positivism. So it is useful, as our author says, it is useful to think about social constructionism as a response to positivism. Positivism is another movement in the sciences, in philosophy, that has its own strengths. It was necessary, in many ways it was necessary, but it also has its blind spots and shortcomings. So social constructionism came as a corrective to positivism in some ways. 
So here's a passage from the book, quote, the positivist view of social science research is particularly rooted in the writings of David Hume and Auguste Comte, who in their different styles both emphasize the importance of using scientific methods to discover the laws of human nature. For these thinkers, scientific knowledge can only build on what is perceptible. We perceive what is out there and we discover what is out there. We don't construct. So part of positivism was uh, adamant about our role as observers, as maybe passive perceivers, and we build our scientific knowledge based on these perceptual building blocks. Uh, we keep reading, uh, positivism in this early period represents a turning away from religion and theological speculations based on beliefs about heaven, hell, angels, and other phenomena not directly perceptible. The positivist movement of the post-Renaissance era was part of a wider attempt to break free from religious orthodoxy, spearheaded by researchers intent on exploring the sensed observable world. Sensed and observable world. These positivist researchers experienced numerous clashes with church authorities, perhaps the most famous episodes involving Galileo Galilei, who was forced to recant his demonstrations of Copernican theory. But critics would contend that in their eagerness to adopt the scientific way, positivists went too far in sticking to a fixed idea of a knowable world. So they were maybe too restrictive. Here we put side by side positivism and social constructionism. Positivism, on one hand, would claim that religious authorities and traditions have constructed bad representations of the world. And science breaks these representations and gives us an unmediated view uh, or knowledge of nature. So science is about breaking free from these constructions, arbitrary constructions, and getting in touch with the real world. By contrast, social constructionism claims that there is no way to be completely free of constructions. There's no way to be completely um, in touch with the, with the natural world in a way that is not mediated by our constructions, by our concepts, by our categories. All we can do is we can replace one set of constructions with another set of constructions. And we can have a construction that is more humane, more fair, more progressive than other constructions, but the very fact of constructions cannot be avoided. Now we should emphasize a few things. Construction does not mean unreal. When something is constructed, when something is socially constructed, and when we claim that, our claim is not that that thing is not a real thing, that it's, it's imaginary or it's ephemeral, it's, it's epiphenomenal. So to put it differently, when we claim that X is a social construction, X, you could put X there, um, anything there. When we claim that X is a social construction, we are not claiming that X is not real. For example, when I claim that money is a social construction, which it is, I'm not saying that money is not real. Other examples of socially constructed entities or categories that are very real, very influential, they organize our lives, our behaviors. They include corporations, contracts, marriage, lawsuits. These are all socially constructed categories. They are all real. They're all influential. They're all organized. They're organizing um, categories in human cultural lives. Okay. The point in psychology is that psychological theories and concepts are also constructions. They are like images of human being. A theory, uh, a theory about human psychology is an image of human beings. For example, the Freudian theory of personality is an image of what it means to be a person. No image is identical to what it is trying to represent, what it's trying to portray. It is an image and in its imageness, it is, it is useful. And it's always possible to reconstruct um, or replace the, that constructed theory with another one. Or you can have imagine a differently constructed theory that is serving a different purpose. When you leave a theory and choose another theory, you construct a new image of human beings. And each image can maybe emphasize different parts of the human being. One 
image might emphasize the social character of human life, another might emphasize the solitary aspects of human life. One might emphasize the feelings and emotions, another one might emphasize reasoning and rationality. An image isn't just about belief. So a theory, a psychological theory, is not just about things to believe in, to, things to talk about. It is also about how you treat other people and make decisions for yourself. And that's one of the basis for judging theories. You don't just say, is it, should I believe in this theory? Is it the right belief? You can also ask, what kind of behavior, what kind of emotions, what kind of treatment of people does this kind of theory lead to? A theory, for example, an, an image that treats everybody as um, selfish or as self-centered or as narcissistic or evil or potentially evil. That, that image, that kind of theory of human beings, what kind of attitude, what kind of decisions, what kind of treatment does that lead to? What kind of social interactions does it lead to? Does it uh, lead to cultivating good relationships with our fellow human beings? So that's just a way to think about theories when we think about psychological theories as constructions. They, uh, we think about their outcome what they lead to, what they encourage, in addition to the justification that they receive from evidence and so forth. Psychological concepts are constructions too. For example, in history of psychology, the concept of reflex had multiple meanings in the hands of different physiologists and psychologists. The same is true for concepts like instinct. Different people might have different definitions, different ways of constructing the, the concept of instinct. Same is true for elements of psychology. If you, the, the very idea of elements of psychology is itself a construction, a social construction. When you divide psychology into uh, parts like, uh, into elements like memory, perception, and one such category, one such concept is executive functions. Executive functions is one of those concepts that nobody has a clear idea of. There are people who claim to have a clear idea of these concepts, but what they mean is that they believe in one particular way of constructing this concept of executive functions based on um, their research methodology. So the basic point here is that all of these concepts come from somewhere, and that somewhere is the activities of human beings, the coordinated activity of human beings, and a kind of consensus other people have to agree with a way of using a concept. Social construction also encourages us to pay attention to how our theories um, lead to dividing people, dividing people into categories. So based on a psychological approach, you might be inclined to divide people into categories of healthy versus neurotic, extroverts versus introvert, Eastern versus Western, you know, the Eastern mind versus the Western mind, the Western psyche versus the Eastern psyche, extrovert versus introvert. And you might be inclined to think about these as not ways of being for every person. You, every person might be an introvert sometimes, an extrovert other times, but you're dividing people into categories and there are boundaries between those categories. And no, once somebody is identified as an extrovert or as an Eastern psychologically, as an Eastern individual, then uh, so many judgments are going to be attached to that category. A more basic question that we should ask here is, what is it exactly that is being constructed? Is it just about concepts and theories? Although these are, um, these are really important and fundamental in our, in our experience, in our shared experiences, but we can describe the whole business of construction, social construction, as constructing a common reality a common social reality is constructed and upheld through the participation of individuals who are appropriately skilled in using the normative system of a culture. So again, think about that caste system. Does it require skill in order to participate in that caste, to, to be able to identify yourself and identify other people? Yes, it does. It does require skill. It requires skill to participate and act as if that common social reality is real and it is important that it is upheld through our participation.
For example, only individuals skilled in the normative system of Shia Islam and thus able to recognize and use the various cultural symbols of Shia Islam could uphold the status hierarchy involving Sayyids and others. Now, you might ask, what is it that we use to construct that, that social reality? Do we start from scratch? Do we start from nothing? Every community has to rely on its own material for the construction of a social reality. And that, and that material doesn't just refer to the physical reality, the chemical reality, the, the brute facts of life. Um, it also can refer to the behaviors or cultural products, cultural processes that are already going on when you enter into the world. Later generations use the construction of earlier generations as material for their new constructions. So you take the, the culture, the, the constructs, the artifacts of the previous generations in your environment and use them as raw material, at least you can, when you construct a new social reality. To refer to something as our construction means taking responsibility for it too. So to, to acknowledge that we are engaged in this process of construction, this process of working with concepts, images, theories, categories, is to acknowledge that we are doing something, that we have a role, we have an active role. Um, in creating and upholding the social reality. So to refer to something as our construction, to admit that there is social construction going on means taking responsibility for it and taking responsibility for its possible improvement. In science, religion, politics, instead of saying this is how things are supposed to be done, we can say instead, this is how things have been done so far and let's see if we can improve them. All right, so that's the point of social constructionism. Um, and if you're interested in reading more about it, again, the chapter is, is there for you. Um, now, because we are at the end of our journey uh, talking about this, this book, there are some further readings that maybe I can just mention, refer to very briefly to these other places we can go if you're interested in. Um, continuing your studies of great ideas in psychology. One of them um, is a book written by our same author, Fatali Mogadam, uh, and it, it is co-authored by Rom Hare. So thanks to my friend, Chris, who brought up this book. This is a most, more recent book. Um, I think it was written five, six years after the publication of Great Ideas in Psychology. It is called Psychology for the Third Millennium, Integrating cultural and neuroscience perspectives. And if you take a look at the table of contents of this book, you will see that it uh, is trying to incorporate both the neuroscience side, both the, the side of psychology that is in that comes from natural sciences and the side of psychology that is coming from, or at least influenced by the humanities, like psychology and justice, or personality and a social representation diversity in a, globe, in, a, in a global context. So this, uh, this book seems very interesting. I might discuss it at a future time. And, you know, uh, further reading number two. This one is called Key Thinkers in Psychology and is written by one of the co-authors in, in the previous book I showed you, Rom Hare. This book is divided into three parts and 10 chapters. And um, each chapter is about multiple, usually multiple th key thinkers in psychology, like Freud, B.F. Skinner, um, Watson, the behaviorist, uh, Vygotsky. So uh, the, the three parts are respectively called from behaviorism to cognitivism, from individuals to groups, uh, to group, <laughs> uh, from theory to reality. Further reading number three is a book called Historical and Philosophical Foundations of Psychology written by Martin Farrell. And I, am, I have a kind of a fondness um, toward this book because I used it to teach um, in 2015. I, I used this book to teach history of psychology for the first time now about seven years ago. And it's, it's very well-written, very accessible. And what I like about it is 
the combination of history of philosophy. Um, history of philosophy is intermixed with history of psychology and the great ideas in psychology. If you're interested in, in, in more narrow focused, uh, narrower and, and more focused uh, view of psychology and great ideas in psychology, in one particular cultural context, namely the Chinese context, here is a book that I really enjoyed uh, a few years ago. I read it and I incorporated it into my course at the time, Systems and Theories in Psychology. Uh, this one is called Themes in Chinese Psychology, and it is written by Catherine Sun, who is a professor at uh, one of the Hong Kong universities. Um, yeah, it is worth checking out if you're interested in Chinese psychology. And Chinese psychology is not one thing. It is, as the author, Professor Sun, uh, argues, it is it could be divided at least to four different types of psychology rooted in different traditions, Chinese traditions. And finally, further reading number, no, not finally, <laughs> further reading number five, there's one more after this, I think. Uh, Jan Valsner's recent book, General Human Psychology, I think published 2021, it's worth reading. It is a, an attempt to flesh out and argue for the importance of looking at human psychology through the lens of uh, culture and cultural processes. Uh, further reading number six, from scientific psychology to the study of persons. This is a kind of a memoir, uh, but it is an academic memoir written by Professor Jack Martin uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, so this book is worth reading. I've checked it out very superficially. I haven't read it yet uh, in any detail, but knowing the works of Jack Martin to some degree, I would also recommend this book. It's a short book. It belongs to a series of, uh, a series of books published by Rutledge. They're all about psychology examined from a critical perspective. And um, Jack Martin's book is uh, certainly worth studying and reading and enjoying and all that. All right, that's the, that's the end. Uh, again, um, games people play if you're interested in signing up. Again, I will teach this if, um, if people sign up for the course. Even with one person, we will do the course. July 9th, 16th, and 23rd. Um, more generally, for more content and for joining the reading group, uh, feel free to visit my Patreon page. Other than that, thank you so much for uh, your uh, for accompanying me through this <laughs> and listening to this series of videos. And this is the end. Until next time, future series and future videos, book reviews. Uh, take care of yourselves and uh, bye for now.